we're first going to head um, to this image that I like to call triple consciousness, which is just ahead. Um, if you look kind of up and to the left of where we are slightly, there's a um, fairly rectangular image with a, an upside down triangle of um, a skyline of Stanford University. So we're all, we can all just head over there together. So at the beginning of this project, which I'll kind of get into it a little bit more when we kind of gather back together, um, but Lynn Kirby uh, started the track for this walking class where, we, where us and um, our peers curated walks together. Um, and my starting point for this, this project was um, exploring a, a neighborhood nearby Redwood City um, as it relates to gentrification and these themes of, uh, around neglected visual culture in marginalized communities. So I, I started uh, tracking Stanford University, you know, as this kind of symbol for knowledge making and yet depletion. Um, and which kind of hones in on this idea, maybe I'll actually talk about this for just a moment. Uh, the concept of aporia, um, you know, you could Google it and it was a lot of words around contradiction and industrial place and growing the area and resulting in gentrification and displacement in neighboring communities. I initially found Stanford as I was developing research surrounding the railroad system running from San Jose to San Francisco in 1863. Uh, Leland Stanford was a politician and an industrialist who initially invested in the railroad system in the Bay Area um, and came to California in the gold rush and continued to build this empire um, that you know developed into this westernized education system um, and has been de deeply rooted um, in these, uh, these systems. Um, so in this sense, Stanford University is this kind of public welfare system uh, that contradicts itself. Um, and so I hiked to the peak of the Stanford Dish Loop overlooking Stanford University's uh, Hoover Tower, um, and I aesthetically discontinued the landscape and yet made it continuous at the same time um, through this kind of reflective effect, creating this new opening in the sky. So drawing on this idea of the arc of return being the symbol between these um, colonizing landscapes between continents. Um, so I was drawn to the idea of how a landscape is falling um, and looks as if it can barely support itself while creating this kind of hidden passage that's revealing these endless possibilities um, where um, when one hits an impasse and hits a dead end, there's still space to keep going and still hope to be found. It seems, you know, never ending. It takes the shape of this triangle to mimic the arc of return, um, which offers a new definition of W.E.B. Du Bois theory of double consciousness, which is the ways typically that black Americans saw themselves in or through the vantage point of one who was not othered. I started expanding and thinking about how how is this realized in 2021? Um, so we could add this kind of this double or triple conscious view of a landscape to the definition of double consciousness and critiquing um, the sensibility of blackness and marginalization through restoration acts and landscape. Um, so I don't want to talk too much at this site because I know mm. we are limited in time. Um, does the cement stone sound good to go to next? Unit? Perfect, sure. So then we can just turn around and uh, move right, over. And just... head right back over to kind of where the green grass was. Mm -hmm. If you are pressing shift, that makes you move a little faster. Representation of the stone you're seeing is reflective of my great grandparents' house, which was built um, in Redwood City in 1944. Um, the house, importantly, was modeled after an architectural style um, of the colonial revival, which largely drew in for inspiration from this really non, quote unquote, non worldly uh, Puritan taste, promoting kind of this lack of diversity in the Bay Area and throughout all. 
all of America at the time. Um, and its presence, its this stylistic presence, um, could soon be, uh, it, it's soon going to be destroyed just because, you know, the house, is, the house that um, my grandparents built will soon be up for sale, um, which stands as a marker for kind of this, this idea of preserved erasure in the Bay Area. And so I was trying to think about um, which is dated probably from like the 50s or so, so it's a really aged old poem that they don't even make them in the States that you're seeing here anymore. Um, I'm using it here as kind of a plinth or the rep this representation of a pedestal um, uh, presenting this kind of historic and underrealized local history um, that's maintained through, again, this kind of preservation of such his damaging historic buildings, um, which could arguably be used um, for you know, low-income housing or other forms of experimental housing and community centers. So um, just thinking again about what these aesthetics uh, of home are doing in the Bay Area and how it's kind of a marker for um, uh, preserving depletion and pre preserving displacement. Um, and so the bulldozer uh, that you're seeing above um, was located in Hunters Point, which is a, another arguably neglected neighborhood in San Francisco um, that largely um, houses the, the Black American community um, and is an underserved uh, community that's you know, arguably, again, falling into a perpetual state of displacement. Um, and so I was trying to daylight, uh, again, these enduring realities by placing um, you know, this marker of erasure uh, atop a plinth to critique kind of these like museological and cultural institutional um, displacements. And so now, um, if you'll follow me, Anita, if you could help mm -hmm. me, because I always forget where. So, so now we are going to the, the basketball is, the yes, uh, the ba we are going to the basketball now, and these are, I drop it in the chat, and also uh, it's very close to this wagon. And I'm heading up here. It's uh, it's a bit hard to to see. It just has this. I'm so fascinated with like when you see the structure, it even smells, right? <laughs> You're talking about the basketball structure. Yes. Well. All the other materials too, but somehow this from this close just makes me even kind of smell this <laughs> old basketball. Um, so uh, this basketball, which I guess all of the objects in this space I'm thinking of as a constellation. This basketball I specifically wanted to, to hide and to only allow viewers to see it from certain vantage points as a um, as a symbol of visibility. Um, so uh, this basketball, which can only be viewed um, through a certain perspective, um, was found and documented actually in, in the class of, in Lynn Kirby's walking class. Um, I walked through Atherton back to my old middle school actually. Um, and ironically, it's one of the most, this neighborhood is one of the most expensive neighborhoods to live in, in America, if not the world. Um, and yet it hosts so many uh, neglected and underserved public schools. I walked back to this school, um, which um, is a severely neglected magnet school sitting in the middle of you know, this large amount of excess. I just, I started to think about um, these markers of visibilities in these sites um, and destitution and trying to again think about how we can in what I'm thinking of and I really was thinking about this space as this um, vitrine or this plexiglass display case uh, conceptually as you know the screens that we're looking at they, they are glass screens um, but it's a more conceptual and modern form quote unquote modern form of preservation so even thinking about you know putting these objects under glass like what is that doing then for these neighborhoods is it doing anything recognizing this neglect. Hmm. Now we can kind of just journey. If you just point your cursor down, we can head down to the wagon. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll see a tide pool sitting above a childhood wagon that's sinking. Do you recognize the column of the, of the wagon? <laughs> 
I, I just dropped it in the chat. So this kind of gritty and busty wagon that you're seeing here um, serves as a reminder of, you know, uh, adolescent domestic toy that encourages younger generations to commodify agriculture, animals, and landscapes. My childhood wagon was mine and my brothers and my sisters growing up. Um, we grew up actually at the house that I just mentioned that my great grandparents built. Um, and it, it was actually in, if any of you made it to the, I was in a, an exhibition at Frost Gallery recently, and, and this was um, displayed there as well. Um, but actually, it was holding a plank, um, but that plank was quote unquote empty, and only it, it had um, uh, classified insects atop the culture. But this work is doing something similar here, but this time it's uh, displaying um, tide pools from Pescadero. Um, so again, uh, the aesthetic of what you're seeing of this wagon um, functions to underscore these contradictions of industrial progress um, and you know what progress actually means and looks like. Does it look like these um, technological advancements on the wheel and moving through landscapes? Like not necessarily. That's not, to, in my view, that's not what progress means. I mean, the ability to transport these quote-unquote goods, right? And goods being land as well. Um, so keeping in mind how I, you know, use the eight symbols that I just spoke about and other pedestals, um, it really informs uh, the way that this wagon is being used as an agent of preservation and revealing these contradictory modes of display um, that are possible, if not imperative, in reshaping the way that we think about cultural institutions. Um, so, you know, again, the tide pool that you're seeing um, that sits, you know, along the neighboring Pacific coast are levied in this sinking wagon, which is um, again, submerging in San Francisco's Bayview or nearby Hunter's Point, um, showcasing the potentialities of these forms of display. Thank you, Hannah. Mm -hmm. I, should we move to the okay. dust cloud? Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, say it again. Which, which one? I think that now it's time to move to the dust cloud. If uh, yeah. And... Uh, I think we can also maybe open up a bit more to like have folks uh, fly around on their own and then uh, after so we're gonna meet on the dust cloud but you are also the dust cloud is just in front of us and we could just like start to move around a bit in the space and soon arrive to the aporia after this. So we are moving towards this Polaroid image, which is on a clip. Or you can press the dust cloud reticulum. May I ask what is on this in this image, Hannah, on the Polaroid? Yes, yeah. So this is, um, and I honestly, I forget the day, this last year. Um, and I feel like folks probably know the date off the top of their head if anyone wants to chime in. Um, but this was that um, that really catastrophic day where we saw our atmosphere disappear, the Pacific in the Bay Area. filter on, how do you um, levy an image so that it reveals different levels of progress or um, So I was thinking about this concept of mythic images um, and their function to inspire hope in a lot of ways, but also inspire false senses of progress. Um, and so I was thinking about this as it relates to local landscapes and um, local catastrophes. Um, and was experimenting with how photographs in particular um, are worlds of their own and are loaded with these um, ideas of progress or rather lack of progress. Um, so, and again, I would love to, if anyone has any questions, please mm -hmm. feel free. Um, Thank you, Hannah. I'm very interested in this uh, dust cloud uh, that surrounds us and that we are in. Yeah. And so this was, a much more conceptual site, I'd say, compared to a lot of the sites that we're seeing. 
Um, this was, again, it was a, taken at my great grandmother's house. It was a cobweb over a broken glass window, um, which took filtering and, you know, um, editing. Um, overall goal was to make it seem as if it's, as if this cobweb was kind of covering this orb as really a, was always in this space. It's just up to the viewer to discover the vantage point in which these, um, this type of erasure and grittiness becomes visible. So mm -hmm. it, it was me trying to understand, to realize like if, if these forms of preservation are already present, how do I just, how do I make it visible? Mm -hmm. um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. And I think now it's time for us to slowly get over to the Aporia site. So we can just uh, go okay. Great. go uh, nearby this archive between broken glass piece that's this direction and then uh, or we can all meet at the aporia which is uh, i will drop in the chat uh, in a second we are meeting at aporia, right? yes and and uh, you are welcome to just fly over on your own or uh, press one second uh, find reticulum 9dba. Yes, 9dba. Nine This might be you are right here. We can all just wait for everyone to arrive. And uh, Hannah, should we uh, move to to be able to see the lion's head? Yeah, let's move a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Jennifer. No. Oh, just just near where you are. It's I think it's it's pretty good here. Yes. Let me just uh, see where are, where is everyone else. So I see Victoria is nearby and Robin and I think that Jennifer is uh was uh, just wa walking. Uh, here here she is. So. I think we are all, all gathering near to Hana, and then this can be uh, the spot for for that presentation. Is this a good spot, Hana? Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so we, much. We have everyone. And also, yes, I would course, like thank you all for being so. Pleased. Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, this place is going to be open. So after the event, you are welcome to look around uh, further, longer slower at your own pace and uh, it's you can also find it in the art camp comments where you can visit the art studios thank you so much for for joining us on this walk and and uh, i'm very i would be very happy to hear uh hannah's further presentation if we are all close together yes yes thank you so much Edith, for helping to keep us on track and for guiding us um, so I'm just really quickly going to kind of lay out why we're here and why this is the final stop and um, the significance of this site. And then I'll kind of break apart why this project is, to me, really important. So uh, the Bed Bedwell Bayfront, which is in Memo Park, kind of, uh, for me, it's, it's in between East Palo Alto and Redwood City. Um, and for those of you who don't know, you know, East Palo Alto um, was a neighborhood that, you know, up until pretty recently was largely housing uh, a lot of the, the Black American community in, in the Bay Area. Um, and my great grandparents uh, started a, or not my great grandparents, my grandparents started a church in East Palo Alto um, that fostered community and um, 
really created this atmosphere that was unlike any other. Um, and so it just, it, you know, when I was taking this class with Lynn, I felt lucky enough to be able to this park that I went to for so long um, and really understand uh, how it's been preserved and who it's really accessible to um, and just wanting to pay it tribute for, you know, those who have tried to preserve it in experimental ways. So um, this is Bedwell Bayfront, um, which was used as a landfill largely until the 1980s. Um, and which was made into a 163-acre national wildlife preserve. Um, uh, some individuals had created this path called the Great Spirit Path, which was a trail um, that's broken, and it's actually still available now, um, and is available along the trails, um, and is broken down into 53 verses and spread over three quarters of a mile throughout the park. Um, and each verse is represented by a large stone sculpture by Native American pictograph art, um, and it. At uh, first, the Bedwell Bayfront Park seems unassuming, um, but it's located near the water treatment facility and other um, industrial areas in the San Francisco Bay. Um, and I do really want to just emphasize that one of the reasons I did want to draw on this area in particular is to really recognize that there are, you know, these cultural workers who are working to curate these walks and to daylight these sites that. Um, are not accessible to those who they're being, ideally being preserved for. Um, and so I'm yeah. drawn to sites like this that are working towards these experimental forms of preservation, um, if that makes sense. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so also kind of thinking back to, you know, what we saw with the first image in our first stop about this concept of triple consciousness, I started thinking this image was taken later than when I had first taken, you know, that kaleidoscopic image. Um, and so I wanted to think about what device could render such a thing, what mythic, if I'm creating a mythic image or a mythic photograph, then, you know, it, it, should there be a mythic device that accompanies that? Um, and so I have uh, this lion's head, which is about 40 years old, um, and is uh, the same uh, lion's face that you're seeing, but from three sides. So I was thinking about um, uh, these, these vessels, um, that have the hold the potentiality, uh, these everyday objects that are, you know, gritty and found and not preserved at the same level of care as other objects um, and other cameras per se, like how um, can we use them to recognize and render these mythic images of progress? Um, and so, uh, as mentioned, in the spring of 2021, amid virtual education at CCA, uh, California College of the Arts, uh, Lynn and I, or Lynn and Lynn's class, we worked together um, to design curated walks um, of pleasure, but also of necessity uh, within, you know, the COVID era. Um, arguably for Lynn, we weren't just participants um, of a walk, but we were the composition itself afoot and were rooted in the landscape and um, understood our practices through personal history. Um, my process um, in both the collaborative class and the virtual art camp um, in May 2021, together activated this special kind of relationship between, again, mythic tales, mythic photographs, travel, and narrative writings. Um, writers and field researchers um, who have motivated my practice and arguably, I quote, correct me if I'm wrong, and have motivated your practice are um, uh, essayists like important essayists like Rebecca Solnit, who wrote *Wanderlust: A History of Walking* um, and *Infinite Cities of San*, *The Infinite City of San Francisco*, um, which were touchstones in in Lynn's class and continue to be a proponent in my physical wandering practice. Um, so, uh, however, for me, like I mentioned earlier, uh, walking doesn't necessarily mean through physical space or virtual space, but um, also employs wandering as a means of navigating literature, um, narrative, and writing, thus finding new paths to personal and so and carving new paths to new personal and social histories. Um, so, you know, you've heard me speak for a bit, like a lot of what I'm drawing on is um, based on literature and, and other theories and other words of others. Um, so the very premise of walking for Kirby's class um, or moving through space uh, was coursed by na directional narrative as well as reading as a means of pilgrimage, um, where I began drawing and collecting these field notes of presented in experimental forms that you're seeing today. Um, some of the objects uh, 
uh, were actually some of the objects that I actually didn't present on, but are in the space were actually collected by my peers. Um, and still proved for me to be really moving, some of the most moving components of this project. To, to me, what makes this space really special is that it really was a collaborative piece where I was uh, really designing based on, on the, my peers and professors' feedback. Um, that's representing, again, this kind of collective vantage point in the Bay Area and perspective of, perspectives of these real and imagined communities. Um, so if you notice, the space is filled with conceptually preserved monuments that meet um, at the literal and representational. Um, and many of the detail of the gritty and unfinished materials are largely found on the street and within other uh, literal margins like the gutters, fences, or other borders of work, um, figuratively speaking, that are unfilled gaps where these canonical visual cultures have buried um, these everyday local histories. Um, so uh, we could see this as a map of collected curated walks as a means of uh, free pilgrimage through material and imagined boundaries, but also as this kind of display and critique of historical modes of collection and preservation. Um, and again, not to be too rooted in theory, but you know, thinking about preservation theory and how it relates to nature, culture, landscapes, and museums, um, really helps to expand these virtual frameworks of walking um, and preserving those forms of walking in plexiglass like we're seeing through our screens today. 